Good morning, Oak Hills Church. Let's stand to our feet. Let's worship together this morning. We're going to sing of the greatness of our God, that there's nothing he can't do. One word. Just one word. You calm the storm and surround. Just one word. The darkness has to retreat. One touch. Just one touch. I feel the presence of Him. Just one touch. church 
Man, what a great song. You can have a seat really quick. Uh, I just want to welcome you on this cold, cold morning. I know we got a lot of our church family not here today, but man, I'm so glad that you're here. Uh, whether this is your 1,000th time to be here on a Sunday morning or this is your very first time to be here, I'm just glad you're here. Uh, and if you're here in person or watching online, we want to make sure and, and draw your attention to some, some next steps. So right in front of you is a QR code, or on the screen we'll have a QR code. Uh, it's, a, it's an easy way, or a little connect card like this, an easy way for you to connect to Oak Hills Church, to get plugged in and get to know people. Uh, whether it's uh, getting involved in a small group or, or learning about the different things that we have going on. Uh, one thing that we want to be passionate about here at Oak Hills Church is, is not just uh, being Christians from the sidelines, but getting actively involved in, in, in ministry and serving other people. One way to do that that we want to make sure and draw your attention to uh, is our Wednesday nights. Raise your hand if you have been on a Wednesday night over the past, let's say, month. You've been here on a Wednesday night. All right, Wednesday nights, we have a packed out house where we serve dinner at 545. So if you don't want to cook, uh, we have some amazing individuals that cook for us. Uh, dinner at 545 to 630, and then small groups, youth ministry, kids ministry. It's a great, great night. And so we would love to invite you. Uh, one of the next steps that, that we talk about a lot is baptism. And today is a very, very special day uh, because today uh, we get to uh, celebrate the baptism of my cousin, Brent Wheeler. All right, Brian, take it away. Take it away. Amen. Well, this is the most, one of the most exciting things for us to be able to celebrate as believers today. Someone who has had a radical life change because they have given their life to Jesus. And if you've been around here for the past nine months or so, you've probably noticed a pretty drastic change in the life of Brent, whether that is up close or from a distance. But he went from a guy that you weren't quite sure if he wanted to be here to a guy who's actively involved in a hope group. He's here every time the doors are open, and he's formed so many relationships and impacted so many people's life here. So we're super excited to celebrate that today. And Brent, I just want to let you know that we are so proud of you and so thankful that you are part of our church and that you've given your life to Jesus. And we want to celebrate that today. And I asked Brent to kind of describe himself a little bit, what he was like when he first started to come. And he used words like lost, confused, scared, lonely. But it was all under this umbrella of this feeling of hopelessness. And though at times I'm sure you still feel maybe confused, maybe a little bit lonely, there's now a hope that lives within him. And that hope Amen. can only come from Jesus. Amen. And we want to celebrate that today. But I want to remind you all that this is not just the end point. This is not something we celebrate and then move along. But it's now our job as the church to come alongside him, to help him grow in his faith and to encourage him in that. And also to be encouraged by his faith that we may not lose the wonder of what it's like to be buried with Christ and raised again in new life. So let's pray together real quick. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for Brent Lord and the change that you've placed in his life, Lord, that you came in and made a way, provided hope when there was no other hope in his life, Lord. I pray that you be with him as he, as he grows in his faith, Lord. Allow him to get plugged in, allow him to serve, and allow him to just keep making an impact for you, Lord. Be with all of us as a church family. Allow us to come alongside him and to encourage him, Lord, and just to be in awe of what you can do, Lord. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. In the Gospels, you see this story. It's a very famous story. If you've ever read through uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you see this story a couple times where uh, Jesus is in the middle of a house and he's healing people, okay? He's healing people. And because of this, the house is so incredibly crowded, right? It's packed. You cannot get in this house. Uh, well, a few buddies have a friend who is in desperate need of Jesus, desperate need of him. So, so they come to this house and they can't get in. They cannot do it. So they decide to do whatever it takes, whatever it takes to bring their buddy to the feet of Jesus. They go up on top of this roof. 
And they began, it sounds really strange to us, the, 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 the clay, the, uh, the, the, the dirt roof, they began to tear through this roof. They grab a rope and they lower their buddy down to the feet of Jesus, one inch at a time. And I want to tell you, church, uh, that's what I've seen Oak Hills Church do for Brent. Um, I've seen you lower Brent down to the feet of Jesus, one conversation at a time, one lunch at a time, uh, serving him, going out of your way for him, making, feel, making him feel a part of this group. I have to tell you, I've never seen anything quite like it. I've been here 18 years, and I've, ne uh, I've never seen anything quite like that. Um, I, I saw a hope group. Raise your hand if you're in his hope group. We've got several all over the place. I've never seen anything like it. I've never seen anything that uh, a hope group so passionate about leading him gently and patiently to the feet of Jesus. You see, when, when that man finally got to the feet of Jesus, Jesus had very simple words. My friend, your sins are forgiven. And we get to celebrate that uh, with Brent today. So on behalf of, of our family, this is my family over here, um, they can't even fathom that this, uh, th this church, what, what, what they've done, what you guys have done for, for, for Brent. I'm, I'm speechless right now. I'm overwhelmed. I'm so incredibly thankful. Um, I invited him last Easter. Um, I got to be honest, I told him, so it's no surprise. Um, out of obligation, like, oh, I guess I should probably invite him. And so I sent him a text the Saturday night before Easter. I sent him a text. Not, he's not going to come. He's not coming to this. But then he said, sure. Okay, I'll come. Okay. Well, I sure didn't think, I, I waited that morning, like, surely he's going to send me a text. He's not coming. And then the next Sunday, he wanted to come back. And the next Sunday, and the next Sunday, and the next Sunday, I will tell you, in the past nine months, I've missed more church than he has. Seriously, it's incredible. Uh, it's, it's a strategy we got to open our eyes to. When people come in here, they may not know Jesus. When keep, people come in here, they might be struggling underneath the surface, and we can't ignore that this strategy works to love them. Just love them. Don't try to change them. Don't, don't like, like condemn their behaviors. Love them. And that's what I saw your, our church do. So thank you on behalf of our family. Thank you for your ministry to my cousin, Brent. Let's stand together and worship as we celebrate now uh, the, the blood of Jesus Christ. That when you have the blood of Jesus Christ, he covers your sins. And we get to celebrate that uh, this morning. So let's, let's worship together. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Why can they be whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And oh, precious is the to his name with all of creation. Let's sing this out together. Gathered at the highest throne Welcome by melody An anthem I have always known A song that's always been All glory and honor, dominion, power to you. Sing this out. A million angels fall, face down on the floor, all to echo holy is the Lord. My heart can't help but sing with all of heaven roar. 
matter what is going on in our lives or in the world, that you are a constant hope and a constant peace. And because of that, we can sing confidently that it is well with our soul because of you and all that you've done for us. We thank you and we praise you for who you are. Prepare our hearts as we hear your word. In your name I pray, amen. Cole, if we could get the, uh, the table. Thanks, man. Well, hey, my cousin got baptized. I'm ready to go home. Like, that's, that's really like the, the highlight of the day. It's just downhill from here. Uh, and so, uh, man, but I, I'm so thankful uh, once again for your investment and your willingness just to uh, uh, go into the difficult spaces uh, with people uh, as, they, uh, as they navigate the faith. Thank you, Jamie. As they navigate the faith and the struggles that they may have. Man, you guys have just done an incredible, incredible job. Uh, today is fifth Sunday, which is why we have our kiddos in here. So if you're new to Oak Hills Church, uh, we do uh, something a little different. Every time a month has five Sundays, on that fifth Sunday, we have the kids come in and worship alongside their parents and listen to their boring pastor. And so I'm going to try. Kids, I'm going to try with everything that I have to not bore you, all right? Wyatt, I'm going to try. I'm going to give it my best. There's no promises, okay? Uh, I have a question for you, young and old, all right? I have a question. What are you afraid of? Some of you are like, nothing. I ain't afraid of nothing. Spiders, right? Spiders, snakes, any snake people like, oh, I don't do snakes. I've told snake stories. They're terrible, right? Like maybe you're afraid of the dark. Maybe some of you, you would just be mortified at the thought of me calling on your name right now and asking you to come and tell us a little bit about yourself. Like coming up on a stage would be like, oh God, right? Like just overwhelming and just mortifying, right? Uh, and the truth is we, we often view fears as a weakness, Right? Like, we would rather not be afraid of certain things, but we just are, right? In fact, depending upon the impact that a given fear has on our life, like, like we seek doctors, counsel, mentoring, we do whatever it takes to try to, like, not be afraid or, or not have this fear consume my life. But when we pick up our Bibles, and I want you to do that, and I want you to look, turn to the book of Deuteronomy, where we've been, what you begin to see is that strangely fear seems to be a good thing, All right? Hang with me for a little bit. Fear seems to be a good thing, okay? If this is your first time here, uh, or if your first time in this series, uh, we're, we're in a series called Preparing for What Lies Ahead, right? We're diving into the book of Deuteronomy, and we're seeing, okay, what are some things that we can learn to help us navigate the ups and downs, the triumphs and the tragedies, the great moments and the terrible moments that will inevitably come our way, Right, just a reminder, the book of Deuteronomy is written to the second generation of Israelites. Everybody say second generation. Second generation. This is a big deal. It's, it helps us make sense of Deuteronomy. Right? The second generation, their parents had already been at the edge of the promised land. They decided not to enter. And now Moses is speaking with like his final words. He's giving them challenges and charges and commands of how to navigate the uncertain future that lies ahead. And so we've seen a few things jump off the pages so far. In week one, we talked about the importance of, of looking back so we can learn from our past, right? Just look at the first four chapters of Deuteronomy, and it's just like a history lesson, right? We see, like, look, look back and learn from our past. In week two, we talked about the, the call to obedience, that followers of Jesus are to be obedient to the commands of Christ. And we talked about that, that difficult uh, biblical teaching on the jealousy of God. And last week, uh, James did an incredible job. James is skiing right now, so I'm a little jealous of him, but uh, uh, he did an incredible job uh, last week of, of diving into Deuteronomy 6 and telling us how to, to train up our children to love God with everything that we have. All right, and, and today we continue on. I want you to grab your Bibles, turn to Deuteronomy chapter 10. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 12. Let's see how Moses continues to challenge the people as they prepare for what lies ahead. It says this, verse 12, And now, O Israel, what does the Lord your God ask of you but to fear the Lord? Everybody say, fear the Lord. Fear the Lord, fear the Lord your God, to walk in His ways, to love Him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to observe the Lord's commands and decrees that I am giving you today for your own good. Notice, for your own good. This is for your own good. Now, we read this, this passage right here, and there's a few things that we've like already gone over, right? Like, like a call to obedience, a call to, to love God with everything that you have. But it starts with a very, very interesting way. It starts with the idea of fearing 
the Lord. Fearing the Lord. It sounds a little strange, right? Fearing the Lord. No, like, like we, we, we fear the, the boogeyman in the closet. We don't fear the Lord. It sounds a little, little off right here, right? Because perfect love casts out fear. God's not scary like some creepy villain in some movie we've watched. He, he loves us, right? But all throughout the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament, time and time again, Scripture is telling us this strange thing that kind of str- we struggle to wrap our minds around this call to fear the Lord. I mean, what does that mean anyway, and how could it possibly be a good thing, right? Because we hear that, and it just kind of throws us off a little bit, right? We fear like the, the evil tyrant, not the loving king, right? We fear the abusive parent, not the loving parent, and so it seems so backwards. It seems so upside down, but to make sense of this, to make sense why this would be so incredibly important, not just to the ancient Israelites as they're going into the promised land, but to you and me in 2023, we're going to kind of dive into Scripture and see what in the world this is talking about. Because fearing God is not just fearing something or being frightened by something creepy, right? That's not what it's talking about. But rather, to fear the Lord is to consider His power, to consider His power and stand in reverence for who He is and what he is capable of. I want to say that again. To fear the Lord is to consider his power and stand in reverence for who he is and what he is capable of. You don't fear a lion if you're face to face because it's creepy. You fear the lion because it's powerful. It's a little more powerful than we can even wrap our minds around. Fearing the Lord is a natural response when we consider the difference between humanity and the divine. Right, when we just, just consider the gap, right? our power and his power, our knowledge, his knowledge, our authority, his authority. The gap is greater than anything we could fathom. Just think about it, like the, the most powerful thing that, that humans could ever possibly create, right? Here on planet Earth, some bomb of destruction or whatever, the most powerful thing. You ever seen the, those, those new telescope images? Right? It's just a speck. Just, I mean, you wouldn't even be able to see the speck. Just a tiny little fraction of a speck when you consider the infinite energy found in his universe. It's nothing. When you, when you consider the smartest people you've ever known, right? And don't point a f- finger at yourself, right? Like the smartest people you've ever known are just scratching the surface. I mean, barely just scratching the surface on all there is to know. And when we consider this gap, it should draw us to fear. Not because he's unloving or unjust, but because we can't fathom how powerful he is. We can't fathom his might, and we can't fathom an eternal outcome of a life apart from him. And so, as the Israelites are on the edge of the promised land again, he's saying, okay, you must, as you're going forward into the unknown, you must fear the Lord. Right now, remember the audience, okay, so it's the second generation. This is a big deal, right? Because The reason this second generation didn't grow up in the land flowing with milk and honey, they didn't grow up in the promised land, is because their parents feared man and not God. They were full of fear, just the wrong direction. They feared what they saw. They're giants. We can't go in there. Instead of fearing the Lord, and Moses is telling them, no, 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 fear the Lord. Right, let's let's do this a little different. Right, and this is what we see in Scripture time and time again. What I want to do I want to jump out of Deuteronomy for a little bit, and we're going to see some some ways in which the idea of fearing the Lord impacts our life and really begins to permeate like like every aspect of our daily living. And then we're going to jump back into Deuteronomy and see uh, how this call affects us as a church, all right? We're going to see four reasons, four things that happen when we fear the Lord. The fear of God eliminates the fear of others. The fear of God eliminates eliminates the fear of others. If you fear God, you have no reason to fear anyone else in the world. No reason. In Matthew 10, Matthew 10 is a cool passage, right? He is, uh, Jesus is, is gathering with his disciples, and he's spurring them on and, and sending them off into ministry, right? He, he's sending them off to, to go make disciples, right? It's a really cool passage. He shares some different things of, uh, of how, how difficult it's going to be, uh, and the truth is he knew what he was doing. He knew that he was sending these out, these guys out as wolves, as sheep among wolves, right? They were not always going to be met with hospitality. They were not always going to be met with, with warm greetings. No, they were going to face major persecution. 
I mean, think about the message they're carrying. The message they're carrying ultimately kills Jesus and kills most of the disciples. Right? Yet he has this, this passage, Matthew uh, chapter 10, verse 28. It says this. He's, telling, he's talking to his disciples as he's preparing to send them out. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Right? Don't be afraid of the, the evil empire, the tyrannical government, or the imposing military, or the really, really rude people that spit in your face. Don't fear them. There's no reason to fear them. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. He's telling us to, to stop fearing the realities of this life. Stop worrying about what could go wrong and, and how we might get hurt in a situation because there's bigger things at play. He's telling them, fear the judgment that comes when you live opposed to him. Fear the reality of an eternity apart from him because that's at, what's at stake. That's what's at stake to, to those he was going to talk. There's no reason to be afraid in this situation. No reason to fear these people. Instead, fear what happens when we live apart from him. All right, second thing, we're going to go quickly through these. And the kids are like, yay, right? <laughs> the fear of God changes our perspectives on others. When we fear God, we view others in a different way. It changes our perspectives. Let's dive in. 1 Peter 2, 17. The author of this is a very important aspect of it. It says this, uh, verse uh, 16, sorry. Live as free men, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as servants of God. Verse 17, show proper respect to everyone. Here we go. Proper respect to everyone. Then a colon, love the brotherhood of believers. Fear God, honor the king. Lowercase. Make sure we see that. Lowercase king. Show respect to everyone. Love your fellow believers. I love that. Like That's what you, you've done for Brent. That's what you've, you, you've done is you've, you've loved him. You've pointed him to Jesus right? Love fellow believers. Fear God. Honor the king, all right? Honor the king. Keep in mind of the context. This is Peter writing. This would be towards the, the end of the first century, and if you've done any history, uh, Roman history, you know, discovery or, or study at all, the emperor in the late first century was a man by the name of Nero, right? And Nero, just, just Google the guy, very, very evil, very wicked, persecution on Christians was more than we can fathom, right? See, the context of this passage of respect everyone, fear God, honor the king, this, the context of this isn't um, the persecution of we might lose our tax exemption one day, therefore we're persecuted. No, it was much heavier than that. The, the persecution was we might lose our lives. Our children might be taken from us. Like, 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 just Google, I'm not going to go into detail, I would if our kids weren't here, but just Google the Christian persecution under Nero, and it's so heavy, you're going to have a hard time reading it. This was the level, and this was the context, we can't fathom this context, but in this context, he's saying, fear God, honor the king, honor the lowercase king, honor Nero. Oh, that's so upside down, right? I mean, that's so upside down. Honestly, like, you read that and you hear that, it's like, this doesn't even make sense, right? Like, like the, this is upside down. This is a radical shift. This is a radical shift from our political world that we live in, right? We are bombarded every single day. It doesn't matter what side of the aisle you're on. You are bombarded every single day with the idea that you should fear the other side. Be afraid of them taking your freedoms. Be afraid of them ruining your life. Be afraid, be afraid, be afraid. And Peter is turning this upside down. You don't have to fear the king. You don't have to fear the unknown future. You don't have to fear, oh, what is the world going to be like in 20 years? Oh, my gosh. These kids that are in here, like, like what are they going to grow up in? You don't have to fear that. Fear the Lord, and you'll be able to navigate those days. It changes our perspectives. When we fear God, our perspectives are a little different. Number three, the fear of God keeps us on the right path. The fear of God keeps us on the right path. Proverbs 8.13, it says this, To fear the Lord is to hate evil. I hate pride and arrogance, evil behavior, and perversive speech. Perverse speech. To fear the Lord is to understand the seriousness of our sin. 
to just consider the seriousness of our sin because we live in a reality where, where many of us, maybe our lives are toxic. Yet because it's not some headline sin, right? You're, you're not like ruining your life, it appears, because of this. Um, we don't address it and we're fine with it. Oh, it's just, it's just who I am. It's my Enneagram number, my Myers-Briggs. It's just, it's just who I am, right? This is the way God made me. No, God didn't just, just make us to be okay with the sin in our life. Yet this is what we do. The disrespect we show others, the gossip, the slander, the secret battle with lust that we don't want anybody to find about, or maybe that thought in the back of our mind that we would never want people to know, but we kind of think that we're better than other people. Those things that we, we, we never try to fully dive into, yet the fear of the Lord prompts us to hate our sin. Do we hate our sin, or do we secretly kind of love our sin? The fear of the Lord prompts us to hate that which will destroy us. Prompts us to have a disdain for, for those actions that we do that set our life on the wrong path. It draws us to hate our sin. Psalm 36 says this, an oracle is within my heart concerning the sinfulness of the wicked. Okay, so concerning the sinfulness of the wicked, this is how it describes him. There is no fear of God before his eyes. For his own eyes, he flatters himself too much to detect or hate his sin. He likes himself too much to fear the Lord. See, when we refuse to fear the Lord, sin consumes our life and our lives begin to look like everyone else. Looks like, like in the church and outside the church. Doesn't really matter. Looks the exact same. Have you ever known people in your life like, yeah, they go to church, but their life looks exactly like those who don't? Don't nudge anybody in here. Don't do that. But this is the reality. Like, we have the same divorce rates, the same pornography use. We talk the same, react the same, spend our money on the same things, date the same kind of people, operate the same way in our marriage, often have the same priorities as everyone else, right? Like, like money, work, family, maybe politics, depending on how you're wired, and then God. And now everyone in here, all of us, myself included, would say, no, 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 like God's number one. But by my actions sometimes, I, I know my priorities are a little mixed up, and I know maybe yours might be as well. This is the reality of our situation. We often see the problem in others, just not in ourself, that ever us. But when we fear the Lord, when we fear the Lord, when we stand in reverence for who He is, and we just consider the gap between His power and my power, His knowledge and my knowledge, His authority and my authority. It draws us to fear Him. And not in some creepy, villainous way, but to fear Him with reverence and awe and wonder. This is the call in our life. Fearing the Lord causes us to hate the sin that destroys us. Fourth thing, the fear of God impacts how we operate in a church. The fear of God impacts how we operate in a church. Acts 9, 31 says this. Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace. It was strengthened and encouraged by the Holy Spirit. It grew in numbers, living in the fear of the Lord. Listen to how it described the church. Would there be that description for Oak Hill's church? They lived in the fear of the Lord. Remember, this is, this is New Testament here. This isn't ancient Israelites. This is first century Christians. They lived in the fear of the Lord. Their devotion was of the utmost importance to the, these people. It wasn't centered around flashy kids programs or really fun activities. Growth didn't come because of some great social media advertising program. Right? Growth didn't come because they gave out free cookies, which we do, all right, to, to new visitors. If you want a cookie, we'll give you one. It's not going to grow our church, right? But instead, growth came when through the Holy Spirit, these people were individually passionate about their faith. They were passionate about their faith. They feared the Lord. Growth came when people feared the Lord and lived accordingly. It's magnetic. It's enticing. It's, it, when, when individuals that don't know Jesus and are struggling in life, when they see people that are living out New Testament faith, that's very intriguing. Now, when they see somebody point a finger at how dare you live that lifestyle, um, never mind, I don't need this. 
we get this upside down all the time. Our role is to fear the Lord and live accordingly and not not simply get upset and angered by those outside the church that don't live that way. So as you read scripture, you find fearing the Lord, a few things, eliminates the fear in others, changes our perspectives, keeps us on the right path and impacts how we operate in a church. But I want to go back to the book of Deuteronomy because something else jumped off the pages at me while I was studying for this sermon. All right, so Deuteronomy, I want you to look up chapter 31 Verse 12. Look that up in your, in, your, in your Bibles. Deuteronomy 31, verse 12. We're going to read 12 and 13. We're nearing the end of, uh, of this, this challenge that Moses is giving. These are some of his actual final words right here. It says this, Assemble the people, men, women, and children, and the aliens living in your towns, so they can listen and learn to fear the Lord your God and follow carefully all the words of his law. Their children, who do not know this law, must hear it and learn to fear the Lord your God as long as you live in the land you are crossing the Jordan to possess. As I started preparing this this message, I soon realized, uh uh-oh, this is falling on fifth Sunday. We're going to have our kiddos in here talking on the fear of the Lord. And I don't want like, like your kids to go home crying because they're afraid, right? So I'm like, oh, like maybe, I don't know, maybe I should change this. And, and then I, I read this and I'm like, well, no. Well, this is exactly what we need to be teaching our children. This is exactly what we need to focus on. I want you to just raise your hand. If you have someone in your life that means the world to you, 18 or younger, just raise your hand if that's you. They mean the world to you, 18 or younger. Do we realize that our children are having their minds warped every day? Do we realize this? Do we realize the severity of what is happening, that their minds are being invaded? Sometimes we forget that. The issues that that you and I maybe didn't even ponder until high school or maybe after high school are being presented as social norms to our 10 and 11-year-olds. Just totally normal. And and often we overlook this, that every day our children, the people we thought of when we raised our hand, our children are being subtly, uh, subtly sculpted by a culture that rejects the authority of Scripture. This means nothing to them. Promotes personal truth, not the truth. Tells them they can choose their gender and not just tolerate, but celebrate behavior that Scripture rejects. Don't just tolerate it, celebrate it. And that's the world, like, that's normal to them. It's not weird to them. I mean, you have parents like, like, oh, like, how do I even do that? Often what we have, often what we have is we have, um, and I'm definitely guilty of this, we have, we have Christian moms and dads Grandmas and grandpas, aunts and uncles, with our arms crossed, going, mm, mm, mm. Whew, I'm glad I'm not growing up these days. Whew, I don't know how these kids are supposed to make it, instead of doing something about it. Right? Like, like mm, mm, mm. that is so hard. It's not a strategy. Instead of doing something about it. See, Moses knew something. He knew something that we got to learn. They're at the edge of the promised land. Okay. When you go in, there's going to be different, uh, tr- there's going to be different morality, different ethics. There's going to be different ways of life that are going to kind of going to come in and try to to invade your minds, and your children's minds. And so, what does he tell them at the edge of the promised land? Okay, not just you fear the Lord, but please, please, as you go forward, teach your children, teach your grandchildren to fear the Lord. He's like, this, this is so important, you can't even fathom. And if you keep reading, you see how, how overwhelming these influences were. I mean, just m- stronger than they could ever fathom. But what he does in Deuteronomy is he, he puts the pressure, he puts the responsibility on two specific institutions. Right? We talked about one last week. One is the family. Everybody say the family. It's on us to teach our children about Jesus. It's on us to, to shape and mold our children in a way that is counter-cultural. See, we live in a day where, where parents, we've often forgotten that it's okay if our kids find us annoying sometimes. 
It's okay if, if they don't like our rules sometimes. I'm not going to look at my 14-year-old and my 11-year-old right now. Like, we just, we just forget this, that it's okay if for a little bit they, they think you're really, really annoying. Because you know things they don't know. Just like when they're kids and all the kids are like, uh-uh, right? Like, no, when, when you're a, an adult, when you're a parent, you're going to know things your kids don't know. See, I, I know the, the power of influence. I know the power of influence on the adolescent mind that is easily shaped and molded. And that, that, that a, bombard, a bombardment of secular humanism has really one outcome apart from the grace of God. I know this. And so, my rules are going to be a little different. And I have not mastered this. By no means is this a declaration of do as I do. But my rules are going to be a little different. My rules around social media, and this does not go over well, but it, it, they're going to be a little different. Around, my phone, around the phone, it's a little different. My conversations are going to be a little different. I, uh, my perspectives are going to be a little different, and not because I want to raise my children in a bubble. I have no desire to do that. I have no desire to raise my children in a bubble, and then the first day that they're off at college, like, woo, go crazy. I don't have any desire at that. I want to train up my children to love Jesus and fear the Lord in the midst of a crazy culture. And listen, like, the truth is, the decision to follow Jesus rests upon that child. We cannot save our children. It's going to ultimately rest upon them. But as many of you know, depending on your phase of parenting, you got about 18 years to be day in, day out influencing our children. About 18 years. And though I haven't launched an arrow yet, I got four years. Four years. It goes quick. Some of, we got seniors, you know, like, so it goes quick. I'm learning, like, how quick it goes. If you have little bitty ones that are here, it goes so fast, it's nuts. I got 18 years, and sometimes I'm going to drive them crazy. Sometimes I'm going I'm to have rules that they think are the stupidest thing in the world. But it's not because I hate them, it's because I love them. We've been called as a family to be the primary teachers of the gospel, not just to rely on the church, but, but us ourselves. While the decision ultimately falls on them, we got 18 years to continue to influence them. Second institution we see is the assembly, the gathering. What did it say at the top of that passage? Gather the kids. Did you catch that? Gather the kids and teach them. Get them together Teach them to fear the Lord. There's a gathering. There's an assembly here. Bring them around like-minded people. Bring them around people who are trying to live counterculturally and pointing their lives to fear the Lord. Church family, I can't express this enough. Your child, your grandchild, your neighbor kid needs church more than you can even fathom. They need it. They're not growing up in the world that you grew up in. Like, it's a different world. They need church. The gathering, the assembly is a place for the adolescent mind to be taught the beauty of Jesus, to be, to be encouraged and challenged with Scripture, even they, if they barely even grasp it. It's just a little bit of an encouragement to help shape and mold them, to spur them on in the faith. And every Sunday and every Wednesday, when our church gathers, this gathering provides for our children a round of encouragement to stay faithful. It's just a little bitty boost. And maybe they leave and they don't think it was a boost. They don't, whatever. I can, I, can, I can take it or leave it. What does it matter? It's just a little bitty boost to teach them about Jesus, to subtly shape and mold them to, to love and to fear the Lord. And when, when they miss, they miss. You know what happens when a Christian parent Mrs. Church, we have the freedom, like if we want, to like watch a sermon online, right? We can, we can totally like, like we can gather our, our, our friends, like, hey, can we grab coffee this week? And, and we can dive into, we have the freedom to do that, whether or not we do or not. We have the freedom to, to listen to a podcast, watch some great worship music on YouTube. Like we have that freedom. 
We have that freedom to kind of get a little boost, get a little encouragement as we try to navigate this godless society. You know what happens when our kids miss? They miss. There's no recovery. There's no midweek like, oh, I'll read this. Way. Odds are they're not. And so every week, bringing them here for a subtle encouragement, it's more important than we can fathom. It's, it's, it's a command of Moses right here, gather the children. Gather them and teach them to fear the Lord. Fearing the Lord is not a thing for grown-ups. It's for all of us. Our God is more powerful than we can fathom. His knowledge greater than we could ever understand. And the consequences of living apart from Him are things we don't even want our mind to ponder. But church, there is hope. There is hope. We're a people of hope. Though we fear God, we don't have to be stricken or paralyzed with this fear, okay? And this is where the, the beauty of who Jesus is comes in, all right? 1 John chapter 4, it speaks of, of perfect love casts out fear. And so you read that, and it's like, well, then I guess I don't have to fear the Lord. Like, no, 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 this, this fits together perfectly. See, we don't have to be paralyzed with the fear of judgment. We don't have to be paralyzed with the fear of, of going to hell when we have the blood of Jesus on us. We don't have to be paralyzed with fear of, of the wrath of God when we have been saved by His grace. When we fear the Lord, we don't have to be afraid of the consequences of not fearing the Lord. So this is an important thing for us to navigate, that if we're going to go into the unknown, the ups and the downs, the phone calls that, that bring you tears of joy and the phone calls that bring you tears of sadness and overwhelming grief, if we're going to navigate that, we must fear the Lord. And we revere him as set apart. We stand in awe of what he is capable of. We're not paralyzed by this fear. Like we are set apart as his with this fear. So I have a few action steps. As the band comes up, I have a few action steps I want to give you. All right, first is to parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, uh, big sisters, big brothers. Basically, if you, have, if you have a child in your home that you are living in, uh, I, I want to challenge you. Think through how to raise your child to fear the Lord. Just drifting through this, their culture is really strong, right? Like just bringing them to church and hoping that's enough, their culture is really, really influential. And so if you are uh, raising, let's kind of go two ways. If you're raising a child um, with someone, you have a, a spouse that you're raising a child with, this week I encourage you to sit down and have a conversation. How are we going to raise this child to, to fear the Lord? What kind of conversations are we going to have? If you were here last week, like James talked about the importance of eating dinner together. Right, what are we going to do like at the dinner table together? If you're raising your, your child or your grandchild and, and you don't have a lot of help, maybe this week just, just think through in your quiet times, how can I train my child to love the Lord? How can I teach them the beauty of a relationship with Jesus? Church, we must be intentional about this because the culture they live in is very intentional with shaping their minds. And if we just hope that everything works out, it's probably not going to work out. Second action step, it's for all of us here, is as we consider the difference, the gap between humanity and the divine, us and our Savior, our power, His power, our knowledge, His knowledge, we consider that. A simple action step this week is to shout praises to our king as we close. Pretty simple. So right now, I want everybody to stand and just in this moment as we, we dive into a, a moment of prayer. As heads are bowed and eyes are closed, we do this every so often that, that maybe by your life, by the actions that you're taking, you're struggling with this. You're struggling with the idea to fear the Lord. And maybe it's beginning to show if you need prayer this week in any capacity, I want you to raise your hand. Any hands? I see hands every, you know, every section we see hands. Here in a moment, uh, you're, you're welcome to come to the front. We're going to have some prayer partners in the back, or you can come to the, the altar here and just commit your life to Jesus Christ. Father, we love you. We praise you. We thank you for the gap that you know so much more than we do. You're more powerful than anything we can fathom. Your authority is absolute. God, forgive us when we, we refuse to fear you. 
not in a creepy, villainous way, but in wonder, in reverence, in awe. May we just praise you, Father. May we take time out of our busy, busy weeks to just lift up our voices, lift up our hands, and worship our King. You are so, so good to us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's worship together. As you can see, he's on a trip skiing, but today 
Um, I just, I'm going to be the announcement guy. I know I don't look as cool as he does, but it is what it is. All right. <laughs> All right. First thing, okay, HIA, uh, they're doing donations uh, for just to get the supplies for all that they need for the entire year. And so it's our goal to just help them out in any way we can. So if you want to help support that, the uh, donation bucket is out there in the lobby. It's black with a red lid, all right? And then the next thing, Women's Bible Study starts um, again this Thursday at 630. Be there, all right? El Salvador meeting, that's going to be on February 12th right after service, okay? So if you want more information about El Salvador, that's the place to be. And then um, if you haven't gotten your year-end giving letters, um, come meet Katrina, and where else can they find them? On the table out there, all right? That's where you got to find them. And then um, I think that's it. So um, if you have any other questions, come talk to any of us. We'd be happy to help you. Um, other than that, as we do every week, we're going to send it off. Striving to be... Have a great week.